The views and opinions expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of Open Sky Radio. Please be advised. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the fire you can't put out. With you as always, my name is Melvin, and I want to thank you for joining me. Coming up on today's episode, I want to talk about Rand Paul. I want to talk about the November jobs numbers. Of course, the war on Christmas is going to make its its debut here on the program. And Time Magazine has picked a person of the year. And he's been covered quite a bit on this show. You already have half the answer. Because I, I said he, so you know it's not a she. I want to start with... Something that's not getting a lot of coverage, not getting a lot of traction. We we try to do that here on the show. I feel like there's a lot of news outlets out there already that are covering all the mega monster things that get a lot of traction already, such as this week, Megyn Kelly over on Fox News said that both Jesus and Santa Claus are white. We're not going to talk about it here because it's been covered ad nauseum, but here is what we are going to cover. It is the trade deal that you have probably never heard of and that the president is trying to fast track right now. And it's called TPP. For a little over 30 years now, the prevailing idea in America was that as long as we go ahead and just turn all the control over to the wealthy business owners around the world, uh, perhaps if we compete in a global market, the the wealth that will be accumulated at the top will eventually trickle down to the rest of us. See, what separates, by and large, um, liberals and conservatives is conservatives believe in the idea of a lot of power in the hands of very few and they would rather those few be wealthy business owners whereas the liberal idea is that full democracy small d democracy that it is spread across everybody everybody gets an opinion all those opinions are taken into account and then we we act accordingly to that majority opinion whereas the conservatives would rather have the guys at the top make all the decisions And that's it. But they believe that they will make the best decisions because they are not going to make any money if they don't make good decisions. They say, well, those business owners make a bad decision. People will go to other business owners. It's true competition, correct? Well, what has happened with true competition, as they like to call it, the free and open market, as as they have lovingly labeled it, is that that has not happened. See, They say that we need to compete with the world, and I would agree, to a degree. I say we need to compete with the world in the way that we need to invest in our own land. We need to invest in our own people. I believe that educating Americans, having those Americans with their educations go out and innovate and start businesses, that's the way I believe that we should compete. But the way that they believe that we should compete is that we need to compete with the world. And that's not possible because there are a lot of countries that still have slave labor. So in order for Americans to compete with those outside markets, we have to be willing to take an incredibly low amount of pay. And I don't think we should have to do that. And I think most Americans would agree with me. The Trans-Pacific Partnership... Minnesota Representative Keith Ellison described it as the largest corporate power grab you've ever heard of. There have been around 19 rounds of negotiation between the United States, Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam. So what is in the TPP? The TPP is just another trade deal like NAFTA, like GATT. Like CAFTA, all these trade deals that happened um, either with Reagan or Bush or Clinton or Bush Jr. And I'm naming presidents here, obviously, because they have a say 
but generally these things tend to get passed by by Congress. So all these trade deals that we've had have shipped tens of thousands of jobs overseas. Um, actually, under Bush Jr. alone, this America lost fifty thousand factories. Think about that. Not just fifty thousand jobs. We lost fifty thousand factories. And all of the all of the jobs that were associated with that. So what's in the TPP? Nobody knows. Representative Alan Grayson has says has said it is a punch in the face to the middle class, but I'm not allowed to tell you why. The Congress members that have seen the leaked documents aren't allowed to say what's in it. In addition to the secrecy, trade negotiators are counting on the Fast Track Authority, which blocks any changes or amendments to the trade deal and only allows for an up or down vote from Congress. President Obama was hoping to get that trade deal passed by the end of this month and implemented next month. On this show, I cover a lot the differences between conservatives and progressives. And what I've noticed is that when it comes to trade, there is absolutely no difference. There are some progressive things about Obama, and there are some conservative things about Obama. To those who say he's a socialist, forgive my frankness, you're a nitwit, because you have no idea what socialism means. And then when you talk about presidents like like Bush, or Bush Jr., or Reagan... Conservative, through and through. No two ways about it. But when it comes to trade, they all seem to be exactly the same. Private corporations from other countries under TPP will be able to challenge U.S. laws and regulation, including those dealing with telecom, health, and the environment, if they think our laws uh, uh, limit their expected future profits. Our 20 years of experience in trade deals going back to NAFTA has proven that jobs go offshore uh, every time we implement one of these deals. Obama has experienced a bit of blowback with, with, with some justice about the TPP deal. And the great thing about Congress, if I can say that, the great thing about Congress is Congress is actually standing up both liberals and conservatives, progressives and conservatives, and Tea Partiers are standing up. Well, Tea Partiers are only standing because they're saying, well, we want to know what's in the deal. Well, look at you guys all of a sudden curious about something. But really, the left and right are not split on this. They don't like this deal. And, yeah, it's still a secret. We don't know what's in it. Some Some documents have been leaked. And it feels weird to stand here in front of a microphone and talk about something that we don't know everything about, but it's not as though your faithful host here didn't look. It's a secret. And if it were a good deal, there would be no reason to keep it a secret. We'll keep you updated on this, of course, but here's hoping that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, which is, no doubt, a race to the bottom. Let's hope that it fails. So, this week, a deal was struck a somewhat good deal. Okay, a true bipartisan deal. Representative Paul Ryan from Wisconsin and Patty Murray from beautiful Washington State uh, agreed on a, a, a spending spending limit of $1.012 trillion in 2014 and $1.014 trillion in 2015, up from the $96 billion required by the across-the-board sequester cuts. So it's a little bit of an improvement. Okay, uh, the agreement offsets the sequester relief with a mix of targeted spending cuts and non-tax revenues via higher government fees and sales, totaling 85 billion over 10 years. That means it would reduce the deficit by 20 to 23 billion. And by the way, that deficit has already been precipitously dropping. The revenue raisers include higher federal worker contributions to pensions and higher airline ticket fees. In an effort to secure conservative support, none of the revenues come from the tax code. So that's the thing. Government workers will pay more into your pensions. You who fly, you will pay more in fees at the ticket counter. 
But there will be no more taxes. There will be no taxing the rich. That's what the conservatives wanted out of this deal. And that's what they got. But here's, here's the great thing about it. The deal also does not touch Social Security, Medicare benefits, or other mandatory spending, which was a necessary prerequisite to win over the Democrats. Now comes the hard part. The deal has to be fleshed out in a bill and passed by both chambers. Then Congress will have until January 15th to pass and consolidate appropriations to keep the government running and avert another shutdown. So, the bill passed in the House already. By the way, just to give you some frame of reference, we are recording on December 14th, 2013, and the bill passed the House. And Representative John Boehner got in front of the mic at a press conference and had some colorful words for the Tea Party, claiming that his people were duped by the Tea Party into shutting down the government. There's quite a few Washington think tanks, largely uh, conservative Washington think tanks that are absolutely unhappy with the deal. They wanted Social Security either cut or killed. Here's the thing about Social Security. So much it is called an entitlement program. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not an entitlement program. We pay for it. It is a benefit. It's an earned benefit. You and I pay into it. And there are trillions of dollars in Social Security. It is scheduled without a problem to pay out benefits to people for at least the next 20 years. I think the number somewhere between 20 and 23 years. And that's without any changes. But if we raise the cap, if we raise the cap on the, on the people that have to pay in the Social Security, because right now I think it's only up to $109,000. After that, you don't have to pay into Social Security anymore. But if we raise that cap, it would be solvent forever. So... A lot of the right-wing think tanks are mad because it didn't kill what they call entitlements. But it's a but, I, but it's a good deal. I would have liked to have seen a better deal. I would have liked to have seen some tax revenues. I would have liked to have seen less cuts. Because see, they also they also cut back unemployment insurance and they cut back food stamps. I'm going to say this. I think I make this point a lot. Um, you can't cut your way to prosperity. If I may use an analogy, um, if to say, uh, let's say America is in debt, we, we are and we aren't. Uh, having some debt is not a bad thing for America. Yeah, we probably shouldn't have exploding debt, but if we have debt, we, we really shouldn't stop spending because the only way we're going to make money grow is by spending. And then of course the multiplier effect that comes from spending that's, I mean, okay, so if you're, let's take it, uh, let's try to use a less than perfect analogy. If you have some debt, okay, some bills you need to pay, um, the way you should do that, the way you should pay those bills, you should find a way to make money, bring money in so you can send money out, right? What's probably the last thing that you should do? The last thing you should do if you have a bunch of debt is quit your job. Because they say, oh, fine, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just quit my job and then, you know, the bills will go away. Well, that's not really the way it works. They have to be taken care of. So the idea that we can just cut our way to prosperity, that things are going to grow if we just quit spending money, well, it doesn't make sense. There's, there's no, it's not sound economic science. There's nothing there that suggests that the economy is going to grow if we quit spending money. Yeah, you, you as conservatives don't like the fact that America spends money, but you didn't mind when the Republican Congress under George W. Bush spent money. You didn't mind the, mind the money that was spent on the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. You know, and all the rest. That money was fine, but then Obama became president. Oh my God, we got to stop spending. Let's let's be honest here. We're not going to cut our way to prosperity, and we're only hurting our own people and telling people that that if they so we have these really cruddy trade deals that have led to a lot of jobs being shipped overseas, and now we're saying to people, well, if you can't find a job, you're being cut off at 26 weeks for unemployment insurance, and that's what it is. It's unemployment insurance, not an entitlement. Once again, it's another thing that we work to pay for. So on the one hand, we have another an, all these bad trade deals and another cruddy one coming our way. 
And then when people can't find work, we say, well, that's just because they're lazy and they don't want to work and all the rest. And you're only getting, you're only going to get 26 weeks of unemployment. And then what? Then they go out in the streets. Then they're broke. Then they're hungry. Now where are you at? Now what are you left with? It's, it's not, a, it's not a good idea. I don't think anybody is, I've, I've collected unemployment before. And I, I, it's not, it's not as much fun as it sounds like. My, my, my saving grace at that time obviously was I was a very young, I think I was 22 or 23 years old. I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. So I didn't have a lot of bills. So the $200 a week that I was bringing in, I was doing okay with, you know, I, ugh, I had to cut out a lot of things. I had to move in with a friend, you know, but it's really not a lot of money. It's less than half of what you made at your last job. It's just enough money to just get you by. Rand Paul said on Sunday that he opposes ex extending unemployment benefits for workers, arguing that it would be a disservice to jobless individuals. He said the 26 weeks that are paid for, he's, he's okay with. He says, but when you allow people to be on unemployment insurance for 99 weeks, you're causing them to be part of this perpetually unemployed group in our economy. He's made these statements on Fox News Sunday. Studies have shown that extended unemployment insurance does not encourage workers to stay home and watch TV rather than looking for jobs. It didn't seem to reduce the job finding rate. They didn't affect uh, uh, people finding jobs quickly. But for people who were unemployed for a long time, it kept them in the labor force, Princeton University uh, economist Henry Farber told the Wall Street Journal earlier this year. Senator Rob Portman, Republican of Ohio, who is part of the budget writing committee, uh, committee said Republicans could support an extension if it's paid for. There is a teeny tiny bit of truth to what Rand Paul is saying. If you are a person who has been out of work, say, six weeks, and you and another person go into a job, and they have been unemployed for, let's say, 30 weeks, well, you look better to the prospective employer only being out six weeks than the guy who was out for 30 weeks. But that doesn't mean that the guy who was out for 30 weeks or whatever is not going to be as good at his job or that he's going to have any less of a fire for the kind of work that he does. You know, as a matter of fact, in my opinion, he would have even more. But what Ron Paul and the Republicans are suggesting is that if you've been out of work for that long, well, you obviously don't want to work. And it's unfortunate. Because it, it's not it's not the case. And then what's going to happen? They're not going to have unemployment insurance. They're not going to have food. They're not going to have a place to live. Do they think that they just crumble up, blow away, disappear? No, they don't. They just become desperate. We did get some good news on the economy, though. The economy added 203,000 jobs in November. Uh, the job report, which was released last Friday morning, so that was Friday the 6th. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that the private sector added 196,000 jobs in November, seasonally adjusted, and government added jobs uh, was were 7,000 for a grand total of 203,000 jobs. The official unemployment rate, which BLS calls U3, and calculates into a separate survey, fell to 7%, which is a five-year low. The seasonally adjusted gain of 204,000 job uh, gain the BLS reported for October was revised to 200,000. The September figures were revised from 163 to 175. The BLS uses an alternative calculation, U6. This is the true unemployment, U6. To determine the number of workers who have given up looking for a job but still want, uh, who, uh, still want one as well as a... a they're, they're, so they're the Americans who are, who are working part-time, uh, part but they want full-time jobs. Those are called the underemployed, or they're the people who stop looking for six, uh, or <laughs> stop working, stop looking for work. Um, and that's called the U6, and that fell from 13.8 to 13.2. While the situation has improved significantly in the past five years in overall jobs, the quality of many of those jobs leaves a good deal to be desired. Measured in real dollars, inflation-adjusted dollars, 
The medium wage of $27,519 in 2012 was $980 less than it was in 2007 when the Great Recession began. In fact, the median fell by $4 between 2011 and 2012. In fact, the median wage as measured by the Social Security Administration is at 1998 levels. And then, of course, there are reports that the Federal Reserve Board is going to begin tapering off its quantitative easing, which, by the way, I don't think quantitative easing is doing exactly what they thought it was going to do. With quantitative easing, they we, we should just be going gangbusters right now, and that's not what's happening. But either way, good jobs report month after month. Even with the government, even with the government shutdown, these things just keep just just getting better and better, but not at the rate that we wanted to. Because see, I saw another report that said there were three thousand, or excuse me, three million jobs that paid more than fifteen dollars an hour, uh, you know, before the uh, economy crashed. Well, those three million have come back now, but of course they pay less than fifteen dollars an hour. See here, we can't. And you can't compete with the world on that kind of a level, okay? That drives down wages. But it is another thing that pushes more, more of that money to the top. I was listening to a conservative talk show host talk about how all of the, all of the income redistribution that's going on. And yeah, he, 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 he is correct uh, to a degree. Because 95% of all the money that was earned last year went to the top 1%. So yeah, it is being redistributed, but it's being redistributed up. Let's get into Obamacare just a little bit, not as much as we usually do. Get this number on your head, 3.8%. You see, up until Obamacare, the truly wealthy in our society, that passive income crowd that dodged the top tax bracket by getting their compensation and what's called capital gains, was exempted from the medical portion of FICA. This tax, 2.9%, went up 0.9% for incomes over $250,000. 0.9%. Now, that's not bad, of course, but for those living on passive income, the hit is much higher. Passive income, those are the people that just get dividend checks. You know, they don't work. They make money, but they, they're, not actually, they're not actually working, okay? So for those living on a passive income, the hit is much bigger. Until now, this law, they were exempted from the tax, but now they're not. So, for example, let's take a guy like Romney. He makes $20 million a year, most of it, uh, most if not all, in the form of passive income. So he was paying at the 15% rate thanks to the special treatment for such what they call special income. That went up to 20%. When parts of the Bush tax cuts expired in 2012. And now, to add insult to that injury, Romney's income is subjected to that dastardly Medicare tax, which, unlike Social Security portion of FICA, doesn't cut off at 106,000. There's the number that we were looking for. So, 3.8% of 20 million is $760,000. Wow. Imagine. The Koch brothers and the hedge fund guys, uh, so the top 25 uh, hedge fund managers in 2009 averaged $1 billion each. 3.8% of a billion? That's $38 million in new taxes for these guys. Yeah, and this is actually what has happened under Obamacare. So, yeah, there was a little bit of a, a tax hike in Obamacare. And it helps pay for it in whatever it does now pay, pay for. Of course, it just goes into the general treasury. But but it's only on the wealthy. I love it. This is – I've always said that the reason that the really wealthy hate Obamacare is because they want to keep the working class impoverished so that they remain politically impotent. Well, what I've, what I've learned now, what, I'm, what I've read is that it's raised the wealthy's taxes a little bit. You're going to be fine, guys. You're using plenty of our infrastructure. You can afford to, play, to pay a little more. So let's talk Google. Google, whose slogan is, don't be evil, seems to be getting in bed with the right wing, but not just your average everyday right wing guys. They're getting in bed with groups like ALEC. 
The group is receiving substantial funding. Now that's in quotes, substantial, okay? Because they give they give some money to to groups, and it's you know substantial and not substantial, okay? Uh, now, U.S. corporations are not required to publicly disclose their funding of political advocacy groups, and so very few do so. But since 2010, Google has chosen to voluntarily release some limited details about grants that it makes to U.S. nonprofits. It's funny that these groups are called nonprofits. Google has a stock value of $330 billion, but they also have a distinctively progressive image, and that seems like it's going to start going away. After uh, uh, in March 2012, it hired former Republican member of the House of Representatives Susan Morlianeri and its vice pre- as its vice president of public policy and government relations. So the CMD examined information uh, released by Google for the years 2010 to 2013. The voluntary disclosures indicate that the following groups are either new grantees of Google since 2012, or have been listed as receiving a substantial. Google Grant for the first time. And they're all here. The American Conservative Union, Americans for Tax Reform, the Cato Institute, Federalist Society, George Mason University Law School and Economic Center, the Heritage Action. Her- now, Heritage Action, they were the guys that developed Obamacare. They won't tell you that now, though. Uh, National Taxpayers Union, R Street Institute, Texas Public Policy Foundation. And, of course, ALEC. The American Legislative Exchange Council, the group that gets together every year. Well, let me just let me just give it to you from Mother Jones. On Wednesday, December 4th, hundreds of state lawmakers descended on downtown Washington, D.C. for a big three day confab hosted by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the conservative advocacy group that brings together lawmakers and representatives of major corporations to draft model legislation on issues such as taxes energy, workers' rights, education, and agriculture. These bills are then introduced into your state legislature around the country. In some cases, lawmakers pass ALEC-inspired bills without changing a word. There are... There were dozens of press credentials laid out on the ALEC conference check-in table when I arrived. This is Andy Kroll from Mother Jones. Mother Jones, however, was not among them. Alex Board of Directors had refused my request for credentials, according to spokesman Bill Meerling. When I'd asked what I, why I'd been turned away, Meerling pointed out that our previous coverage of, of Alec, and he said it was clear that Mother Jones fundamentally hates Alec. We've covered Alec for more than a decade. A 2002 expose titled Ghostwriting the Law, coverage of the group's proposals regarding voting rights and workers' rights, uh, and more recently, the departures of big-name corporate members. At the same time, he was explaining why I couldn't attend, merely stressed to me that Alex is moving towards transparency, and then to his credit, he acknowledged the irony. See, after the, after the Trayvon Martin killing, which was m- made possible by the Stand Your Ground laws, and of course, there's Trayvon was the one that got a lot of press, but there's a lot of these happening all over the nation. Um, after the Trayvon Martin killing, it became pretty clear to people that the Stand Your Ground laws really just essentially made it legal to kill somebody. It 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 says the old idea was if somebody engaged with you. You could engage with them and then just about anything that that happened between you, you could claim self-defense. What the stand your ground laws say is you can go out, pick the fight, engage, and then it is essentially your responsibility to finish that fight however you see fit. Under the old laws... Um, the castle laws, as they were called, because it covered what happened in your house. Uh, th- that kind of thing had to happen in your home. You know, once it was in your home, essentially, you know, anything goes. It's in your home, and they don't belong in your home. But this puts the castle laws into the streets. So, and 
a lot of folks call them the shoot first laws. I call them the legalized murder laws because that's exactly what they do. Despite all the things that have been said about George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman was out looking for what he called uh, suspicious troublemakers and all the rest that night. He saw Trayvon Martin walking through the rain with his hoodie on. He called 911. He called, he called Trayvon in the phone call. You can hear it. He calls him a coon. So, just so we know, the killing wasn't racially motivated. He then got out of the car. What happens next is anybody's guess. The, they say that Trayvon Martin grabbed him by his head and smashed it on the ground. Well, had George never gotten out of his car, that would have never happened. The police told on the phone, the 911 operator told him on the phone to stay in your car. He got out with a loaded weapon and the intent to kill. If Trayvon did smash your head on the ground, well, you came after him and you were armed. What ultimately happened is a 17-year-old kid was killed and George Zimmerman became a hero to the right. Let me be clear, not the entire right, just the gun nutty portion of it. So after that became public and George Zimmerman got away with murder, and he did, and I made on the case on this program that we are not a Christian nation because we, because George Zimmerman admitted to killing the boy and we as a nation were deciding whether or not he should go free. He murdered. He violated a commandment. And we're discussing about whether or not he should go to prison. He murdered. It's pretty clear. He should have. But he didn't. And that shocked the nation. That disappointed a lot of people. One of the jurors in the Trayvon trial came out about a month or so ago and said that the, that the decision that she made in that trial has absolutely ruined her life. And it made Alec look very, very bad to a lot of Americans because a lot of Americans found out that Alec wrote the legalized murder laws, the stand your ground laws. And of course, George Zimmerman is free. Trayvon Martin is in, well, dead, buried. But Zimmerman is free when he should be in prison. So, Alec is looking for a way to get members back so they can start making money again. Here's hoping that they can't do it. Speaking of prison, I want to get into this. Private prisons in some states have have language in their contracts that state if they fall below a certain percentage of capacity that the states must pay pr uh, private prisons millions of dollars. Less, they face a lawsuit for millions more. Here's the thing. A lot of our prisons in America are private, which is one of the reasons you see tougher laws being pushed for, which is why you see things like for mandatory minimum sentencing, which is why there's such a gigantic fight um, to not change the drug laws because this keeps tons of people in prison obviously if a prison is run by your state it is run at a lower cost and it is not in the interest of the states or the American people to get more people in prison to keep more people in prison to have a gigantic exploding prison population because it's expensive well when those prisons are privately owned like when they're owned by the CCA the Corrections Corporation of America, well, there's lots of reasons to keep people in prison. And now the contracts that are being drawn up and given to the states are saying that you, that we, the people, have to keep those prisons full so that CCA can make as much money as possible. Uh, in the public interest has reviewed more than 60 contracts between private prison companies and state and local governments across the country and found language mentioning quotas for prisoners in nearly two-thirds of the contracts reviewed. Those quotas can range from a mandatory occupancy of, for, uh, for example, say 70% occupancy in, in California or, as it is in Arizona, 100% occupancy. One of those private prisons... The Corrections Corporation of America made an offer last year to the governors of 48 states to operate their prisons in 20-year 
contracts according to in the public interest. The offer included a demand that those prisons remain 90% full for the duration of the operating agreement. Private prison companies have also backed measures such as the three-strike laws that maintain high prison occupancy. When the crime rate drops so low that the occupancy requires can't be met, taxpayers are still left footing the bill for the prison as if it was full. The report found that 41 of 62 contracts reviewed contained occupancy requirements with the highest occupancy rates found in Arizona, Oklahoma, and Virginia. And I think that it is time to get the private corporations out of the prison business. They, they, they shouldn't be trying to keep the prisons full. It costs us money. It, and I think things like if you've got a drug problem, that seems to me like it's more of a health problem. And that prison isn't necessarily going to help you. They shouldn't own our vote. Private corporations, they shouldn't have, they should not own our vote. And they should not be running our prisons. So guess who's become a lobbyist? Um, Joe Lieberman. Silence, right? Nobody cares. Of course. Hey, now you'll remember. About a year ago, Lieberman promised twice, twice that he was never going to become a lobbyist. But this past Wednesday, Joe Lieberman registered to become a lobbyist. According to a report from Political Lieberman registered to lobby on behalf of a Libyan politician. While the law holds that, Lee, that Lieberman cannot personally lobby lawmakers until 2015, there's nothing stopping Lieberman from providing strategic insight and consultation to those who are able to directly lobby. So, as MSNBC Stephen Bennett put it, Lieberman can't say, let me call the chairman of the committee for you and tell him about your work. But he can say, you should call the chairman of the committee and tell him that I referred you. Government relations. In case there are any doubts in DC, a government relations contract is a lobbying contract. When someone goes to DC, to a DC firm to hire professionals to tackle government relations services, including meetings with members of Congress, executive branch officials, and others, they are hiring lobbyists. Now, lobbying is perfectly legal. Okay? But it's still, it's still pretty scummy. And he said he never would. <laughs> I suppose that's my uh, my DM my DM for the week. All right, so let's get into the war on Xmas. Gretchen Carlson on Tuesday lashed out at atheists in Florida in Florida for putting up a Festivus display next to a Christian display at the state capitol building. Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a national religion. We have the separation of church and state unless it's Fox News. And they bring up this BS war with Christmas all the time. Uh, uh, Sarah Palin just wrote a book, you know, Good Tidings and Cheer and whatever the heck it's called. And she's arguing the liberals want us to say happy holidays and it's, it's, it's crap, but it's red meat to the conservative base. So in Florida, uh, government, uh, Governor Rick Scott uh, his office approved a request to install a Festivus pole made of Pabst Blue Ribbon cans next to a nativity manger and a Three Wise Men display. Festivus, of course, is a holiday created by the television show Seinfeld, but uh, it often it's often celebrated by atheists as an alternative to Christmas. You'll remember uh, Festivus, Festivus for the rest of us, right? So uh, Bill Donahoe says, I am so Outraged by this, uh, Phil Do Bill Donahoe, of course, works for the. Uh, he's the Catholic League president. Why do I have to drive around with my kids and look for a nativity scene and be like, "Oh yeah, kids, look, there's baby Jesus behind the Festivus pole made out of beer cans." This is another quote. We don't, we don't have the clan out there on MLK Day with their monuments right next to a bust of MLK. We don't want to have neo-Nazis out there to stick it to Jews on Yom Kippur. Yeah, these are his, these are his actual descriptions, right? Nazis and Jews, the Klan and, and black people. It's not the same. Festivus is a, uh, arguably a religion or non-religion, an alternative to your religion, an alternative to your Christmas. It's not a big deal. Uh, American atheist President David Silverman argued that the season does not belong to Christianity, and I would agree. 
Christianity actually got the season from the solstice. We'll get into that another time. Eh, maybe next week. Christmas is just right around the corner. Uh, let's stick with Fox News. Fox News has been paying ousted executives millions, millions in hush money. So there was one gentleman, um, let's see, this comes from Gawker. It says Brian Lewis, an ousted former uh, employee who used to work with Roger Ailes, was paid by Fox News in a recently uncovered settlement. Gawker, which reported the figure on Monday, described the payment as hush money. Lewis, who was Ailes' right-hand man for years before falling out with him, was clearly a potential threat to Fox News and News Corp. As his lawyer told the media in a statement in June, Roger Ailes and News Corp have a lot more to fear from Brian Lewis telling the truth about them than Brian Lewis has to fear from Roger Ailes and his toadies telling lies about Brian Lewis. This isn't the first time this has happened. British newspaper chief Rebecca Brooks, for instance, was paid a whopping 17 point six million when she resigned from the company ladies and gentlemen what is happening over there at fox news that when people leave they have to pay them millions to be quiet if things were on the up and up over there at the fox news channel they wouldn't they wouldn't have to oh my lord i would give my left foot just to hear the things that those people have to say all right, so in a column published on the Fox News website last week, uh, I want I want to I want to get into here. Let me let me. I'm starting this the wrong way. So, Time Magazine has named their Person of the Year, and they had they they of course they get down to a short list and they announced what the short list was and and Miley Cyrus was on the short list and and Ed Snowden was on the short list and Pope Francis was on that short list and uh, a few other people I really don't care about because Pope Francis is the person of the year. Bam 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 just like that. Oh. And conservative heads were exploding all over the place. It was a beautiful sight. It will continue to be a beautiful sight. Now, person of the year doesn't necessarily mean Yay, the best, because remember, Miley Cyrus was also on that list. But it is who made, uh, who was the most significant? Who made the largest impact? And if Pope Francis hadn't got in there this year, it would have been Ed Snowden. Okay, so conservative heads exploding. Bam, let's listen. In a column published on the Fox News website last week, Adam Shaw put a target directly on Pope Francis uh by comparing him to President Obama. You know what this means? This means that Fox News is at war with the Pope. My, my, my. Pope Francis, quote, Pope Francis is undergoing a popularity surge comparable to the way Barack Obama was greeted by the people uh, in 2008. And just as President Obama has been a disappointment for America, Pope Francis will prove a disaster for the Catholic Church. Adam Shaw claims Pope Francis is hurting the Catholic Church because he's not conservative enough. <clears throat> According to Shaw, Pope Francis is apologizing for the Catholic Church in the same way conservatives believe that Barack Obama was apologizing for America. Because Pope Francis has... Is my voice just dripping with sarcasm right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, so, a recent Pew poll shows... Uh, 79% of Catholics and 58% of people in general approve of Pope Francis. So he's pretty popular. I'm not a religious person. I generally don't even care who the Pope is. So this is, this is fantastic news. Okay. Shaw denies that America practices the kind of savage capitalism that generates wealth for the few while pushing millions into poverty. Uh, Pope Francis attack on the conservative trickle down theory of economics has caused right wing heads to boom. Okay. Instead of supporting Pope Francis' effort to improve the lives of the poor by condemning the very economic policies that have ravaged millions around the globe, Shaw, wish, Shaw wishes Pope Benedict, who called Muslims evil and who called for converting Jews uh, to de uh, uh, converting Jews to deliver them from the darkness, uh, who pardoned Holocaust deniers, was anti-science and was embroiled in the predatory priest scandal. More on that in a minute. In his Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, released last month, Pope Francis directly attacked the conservative economic view. And yeah, Pope Francis has decided he's going to set up a commission on how to deal with pedophiles. 
Uh, there are very few details at this point, but it is definitely, it is definitely going to happen. So, Pope Francis is good for the world. Pope Francis is good for America. He is the person of the year, and as a religious leader, the conservatives are none too happy with him. <laughs> All right, so let's get to one thing good that Congress did. Uh, one thing is good, but there, they, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of courage involved here. Okay, uh, the House passed a ban on public guns. Okay, Tuesday, uh, uh, October third, or excuse me, December third, Republicans quietly passed gun control legislation. What the heck did they pass? The bill, which renews the 1988 Undetectable Firearms Act, faced so little opposition in the House that it was only debated for ten minutes, and then it was passed on a voice vote. Why was it passed on a voice vote? Because the the Republicans and some Democrats wanted absolutely no record of who voted for it. Because the NRA has deep pockets and would have spent endless amounts of money defeating those people. You want to know who runs Washington? It's Alec and the NRA. And the Koch brothers. So the vote doesn't implement new laws. It just extends a current one banning guns that don't contain enough metal to trigger uh, x-ray machines. So here's the thing. And this was Reagan, by the way, the who was wildly conservative. Um, he believed, and he pushed this idea, and of course it was passed by his Congress, that guns should contain at least some metal parts. That way... We can kind of control where they go into, right? You can't take one on a plane, you know, if, if the president is gonna be somewhere, they've got, they cause there's metal on them, they've got ways to check you before you go into, say, you know, he, he was recently at the Mandela funeral before you go into the, the soccer game or before you go into the White House or before you go into whatever stadium he's speaking at or whatever town hall. Um, but, so the idea was that there should be some metal, not all, but there should be some metal. That way we can detect them with a metal detector. Recently, it has come up uh, with the new 3D technology that is obviously on the horizon that eventually we're going to be able to make guns with no metal parts whatsoever. Guns that can fire and guns that can break skin. There's There's videos on YouTube right now you can just punch in you know, 3D guns or whatever keyword you want, and you'll find the videos of guys firing off these guns made only out of plastic. And of course, it's such a it's such a new thing, the 3D technology, and of course them and their designs and their templates, that the guns, after a few shots, they disintegrate in their hands, but hey, they have successfully made guns with no metal parts, undetectable. It's an absolute nightmare. So... When the bill came up, it was passed and passed on a voice vote. But Chuck Schumer said that he wanted to bring it up again, and he did this past Monday because he wanted he wanted to strengthen it. Specifically, his bill would require that guns contain a piece of metal that is intrinsic to the operation, such as the barrel or the trigger handle, rather than an ext extraneous piece that could be removed before a gun is put through a metal detector. So a, so a vital part. And that's where the Republicans said absolutely not. You know, they stripped that out of his bill and they, they went ahead and they passed it again. But it's, So it's a good thing that it passed. And gutless people passed it. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll have to watch where this goes. Okay. Um, I want, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on firearms this week. I, I'm getting kind of sick of it myself, but this is t the day. Today we are recording. It is the it is the one year anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting, where 20 first graders were slaughtered in their in their in their classroom, uh, along with six teachers. And the and the guy that killed them, Adam Lanza, he killed all 26 people with w in less than five minutes. Okay, and there have been. Hundreds of children killed since then. And the news is just littered with these kinds of stories. So let's start with this one. The Miami Herald reports that a, uh, the witness, inmate Michael Nastal, made the claim to Michael, uh, uh, excuse me, Miami Dade ju uh, jurors in the trial of 20 year old Jason Beckman, who was accused of murdering his father. He has said, okay, that before the killing, 
Okay, this is Michael Nostal. He said that before the killing, uh, the boy and his father were talking about Transformers star Megan Fox. Beckman's father joked that his son wouldn't know what to do with that. So the son went and got a shotgun and blew his dad's head off. Part of the idea with uh, of access, or that there being so many guns, so every time there's a shooting, they say, well, we just need more and more guns. You make every gun, or, you know, every zone, every, every building, every house, there's no gun-free zones. Everything will be just fine. Well, here's the problem with access to those guns. People, especially mentally, mentally ill people, and they're saying that this one may have Asperger's syndrome, which is a mild form of autism. That kind of access, um, whereas this boy may have just gone and walked off and blown off some steam or, you know, went and did a rant on the internet or, you know, called up one of his friends and my dad is a jerk. I mean, that's a pretty typical thing, but he didn't. He went to the back room. He got a gun, he came out and he blew his dad's head off. And it's a decision he'll have to live with for the rest of his life. And it's a permanent decision. But with that kind of access to guns, the sacred access in America, we, we need this kind of access to guns. Those decisions are made really easily and without thinking. And there's very little thought for the people that are being murdered. So, let's go to Iceland. Quote, this does not happen in our country. Said Thora, a news editor at RUV, the Icelandic National Broadcasting Service. She was referring to a 59-year-old man who was shot by police on Monday. The man who started shooting at police when they entered his building had a, had a history of mental illness. It's the first time someone has been killed by armed police in Iceland since it became an independent republic in 1944. See, poli po the police don't even carry weapons usually. Violent crime in Iceland is almost non-existent. The nation does not want its police force to carry weapons because it's dangerous It's and it's threatening. It's a part of the culture. Guns are used for hunting as a sport, but you never see a gun. In fact, Iceland isn't anti-gun in terms of per capita gun ownership. Iceland ranks 15th in the world. Still, this incident was so rare that neighbors of the man's shot were comparing the shooting to a scene from an American film. The Icelandic police department said officers involved will go through grief counseling and the police department has already apologized to the family of the man who died, though not necessarily because they did anything wrong. I think it's respectful, Thora says, because no one wants to take another person's life. See, that's the way we're supposed to feel when somebody dies. We're supposed to care. They went to the man's family to comfort them and to apologize. They didn't say, Second Amendment, America, got what he deserved. They actually feel bad that they had to murder somebody. This comes to us from Richard Rowe, writing for AATTP.org. Uh, AATTP he says, I am a gun owner and enthusiast. My owning firing credentials include, well, there's a whole list of guns here, okay? So he's talking about how to talk to a gun nut. And this is a very good argument. It's called uh, How to Win an Argument with a Gun Nut Every Time. It's a very, very lengthy, lengthy article. So I'm just going to refer you to it. And I'm just going to bring up a few things here. And then if you want to look up more, you can go over to aattp.org. Uh, this is from back on November 15th, 2013. So again, some of their arguments. Stop harassing the members of our peaceful protest. If nobody got shot, it's a peaceful protest. No. They're not, and no, it's not. There's nothing peaceful about displaying killing tools to get a reaction. And yeah, that's what a gun is. It's a killing tool. Another one. Shall not be infringed. The right to bear arms is already infringed for many, many very good reasons. Here's a short list of things that could easily happen if we were to give you your way and remove all infringements and completely deregulate the Second Amendment. A career felon could walk out of prison and purchase a fully auto AK-47 from Walmart. Your psycho ex could buy a sniper rifle and silencer from some guy for $100. A mentally handicapped child could get a pistol from a vending machine at your kid's school. The Second Amendment is our only protection from tyranny. Right? You love hearing that? No, listen. They have drones. They have laser-firing aircraft that can blow every everyone up. Okay? Within a 50-mile radius. They have... Surveillance satellites, nuclear bombs, uh, missiles, poison gas, tanks, aircraft carriers. 
The U.S. government beat the Third Reich. Okay? A good guy with guns versus the bad guy with guns. Okay? A good guy with guns is our only protection. We need more guns to protect us. More guns are the solution. Mm. That's true, at least once the bad guy gets a gun. Following this line of thought, you would end up living in some combination of Rwanda and hell. A war zone where nobody knows peace and everybody lives in constant fear. Or as you might call it, just another day. Gun regulation is a slippery slope. Gun grabbing is next. No, no gun grabbing is not next. See, the United States passed its first gun control laws prior to the Civil War, criminalizing possession of firearms by blacks. You heard that correct. Blacks. They said blacks cannot have guns. Gun regulations have existed in the United States forever for about 150 years, uh, evolving many times since then uh, to cover machine guns and assault rifles. Everyone who doesn't agree with us is a gun-grabbing commie. <clears throat> 80% of us in the middle, between the nuts on both ends, would just like to get shot at a little less. And I think that that's, I think that that's okay. Okay. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. All right. Agreed. 90% of all murders committed by people with four or more adult, uh, committed by people with four or more adult felonies, which is exactly why we're trying to keep those people from getting guns. Okay. The mentally ill shouldn't have guns. Criminals shouldn't have guns. Background checks won't do nothing but make it easier for liberals to get our guns. These are really insane arguments. <laughs> About 61% of Republicans believe that background checks will lead to the conf uh, confiscation of currently legal guns. Only 32% of Democrats believe that, compared to 96% of Democrats who favor checks. Going by that alone, 64% of de Democrats only want gun reform to curb future sales. That's more than the per percentage of Republicans who believe that confiscation is the agenda. Getting guns is not the idea. Keeping guns out of the hands of people who don't need them, that's, that's the idea. Nobody wants to take your guns. <sighs> I, <laughs> nobody wants to take your guns. Okay. And there's more guns in America than there are people. Or I believe we're approaching that. We're like over 300 million. You know, and nobody. <sighs> Why is it? They say the Second Amendment, that is sacred, right? They forget the whole uh, well-regulated part of it, of course. They, they say the Second Amendment, you can't, because the Constitution and the Second Amendment. Well, I would submit to you that my right to vote is my First Amendment right. And yet, in state after state, Republicans are working to take away the right of people to vote. Funny how that's not sacred. So we are on the one-year anniversary of Newtown. I can't even describe to you how I felt that day. I visited my dad's house um, this past summer, and uh, I think my dad and I generally agree on uh, gun policy. There's a lot of other politics that we don't agree on. Um, we don't talk about it, and it's it's too bad because uh, I love my dad very dearly, and I wish and I think that I think that my dad and I we uh, we want a lot of the same things, if I can if I can say it that way. So we don't we we disagree on the means but not necessarily the ends and it's unfortunate that we don't get to talk about politics i you know I, one of these days perhaps um he's good people uh anyway but we're 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 the same when it comes to guns um and when i visited his house this past summer uh, it struck me when i was looking he has a wall in his garage which is where i, I suppose that would be where his man cave is at and he had uh pictures of the Newtown kids on his wall. Cause that, and that struck me. Cause the Newtown tragedy hit me, uh, in a monster mega way. Um, I've got kids in an elementary school. My wife works in an elementary school. My youngest daughter's about to go to an elementary school. And the fact that some psycho walked in and in under five minutes slaughtered 26 people. It scares the hell out of me every day, and I live with it all the time. I'm I'm never out of that frame of mind. I know that I live in America, and that there's a lot of people that are fighting for these gun nuts to not be regulated, 
and and to get access to as many guns as they want and as many high capacity magazines as they want so that they can carry on further slaughters and i live with a great deal of fear because of that it really it really doesn't go away for me so the Newtown officials have asked the media to stay away on this one-year anniversary. Newtown government officials have asked the media to steer clear of this town, uh, of their town, when it marks the first anniversary of the massacre at Sandy Hook. The community is choosing to remember and honor those who lost their lives in Sandy Hook um, in, a, in a quiet way. Uh, Newtown First Selectman Pat Ladora said in a written statement obtained by USA Today, we're fully aware of the tragedy. We're trying to say to the world, please give us a chance to grow into that really happy, healthy place that loves children and families and that has great schools. We need you to help us get in there by staying away. They want to. They decided they want to mourn in their own way. Uh, USA Today confirmed on Monday that it will not be covering the anniversary. CNN's Brooke Baldwin said uh, that CNN will not be reporting live from Newtown. NBC and ABC have also said that they have no plans to dispatch fully equipped crews to Newtown on Monday. And this brings us to our final thought. Yeah, it's been a year, and that's absolutely mind blowing. Um, the the parents obviously live with the pain and will for the rest of their lives and they've been they've been working in Washington trying to get gun laws passed common sense gun laws that would just keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people and of course they've been fought every step of the way by by gun nuts and and by the NRA and all the rest um yesterday friday the 13th friday december 13th there was another there was another school shooting this time in Colorado I believe uh, three were killed, including the gunmen. So it wasn't as high as some of these other ones that we see, but no less insane. There are school shootings now that don't even get covered by the media. Why? Because we have so many of them in America. It's really just another day. In Australia, we reported on this show a number of months ago, how they got rid of the gun problem in their country. Uh, they don't have – their people don't own weapons of war and they haven't had a single mass shooting ever since. So there goes your argument about how we just need more guns everywhere all the time and as many guns and bullets and all the rest as we can get. It's not true. I just read to you a story about Iceland, how their police don't even usually carry guns. And for the first time in over 50 years, they just killed a suspect. And they're sad about it. Here in America, he would be celebrated. We really need to change the way that we think about guns. I really thought that the slaughter of 21st graders, I can't even imagine the fear that they felt when this guy walked into their classroom to classroom like he was a video game with these gigantic bullets ripping these children in half. I can't even imagine the fear that those children felt. And I would have thought that that kind of thing would have changed the way America thinks about guns. No one's talking about getting rid of them, but we definitely need to re-examine our relationship with those guns. And we don't live in America. Yeah, perhaps you have a right to own a gun, but I and my family also have a right to not be killed. So we join Newtown on this day. And even though I'm speaking very quietly into this microphone... I just want to say, yeah, I'm out here. I'm a parent and I know how you feel. I can't fully say that I empathize because it hasn't happened to me, luckily, and I hope it never does. But we hear you out here and we're with you, Newtown. And we want to see those common sense gun laws enacted as well. And yeah, there will be a day when uh, here in America, it is okay to pass those laws and NRA isn't the most powerful body in the United States and less of our people will get killed and it will be news if a school shooting happens or perhaps maybe we enact the right kind of laws and we won't have to hear about first graders being torn in half by gunfire ever again. Please forgive the graphic language that I have used on this microphone tonight. But if that kind of thing doesn't change the way you feel about guns, you need to re-examine your own morals. Because there is, because when the right to own a weapon of war trumps a first grader getting, getting to grow up, or, or, or for me and my family to not live in fear, when your right to own a weapon of war trumps that, you need to re seriously reevaluate your values. 
It's un-American. And it's unconscionable. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us here on The Fire You Can't Put Out. I want to send a big shout out over to Open Sky Radio for putting us on. We have been here over one week short of a year. And it has been wonderful being on Open Sky. Gentlemen, I do hope everything is okay over there at OSR. Uh, big shout out to my producer, uh, Kevin. Uh, I want to thank you for, for helping me uh, put these shows out every week. It, even though I am the only person you hear on this mic, trust me, it is still a collaborative effort. Uh, we are still here. We are still progressive. We are still on fire. And we are going to keep on keeping on. So next year will be our one anniversary show. I have no idea how that's going to go just yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it. I want to thank you, the listener, for tuning in and hanging out with me for another hour this week. All right. Go on. Be with your families. Go do your thing. Da-da-da-da-da. Uh, we are the fire you can't put out, and we will prevail. Good day, everybody.